Hello, hello, it's Jason Heath with Contra Race Conversations coming to you with another solo show. This is the third of six here in the month of March, just changing things up. And I'm recording this at night, which is totally weird for me for the podcast. I almost never do anything after 5 p.m. these days. It's almost 8 p.m., whoa! But my wife is working nights, and I'm a podcasting fiend when she's at work, I guess. It's a super nerdy thing to be, but that's what I am. And today, we are covering base sections, and student base sections in particular, and this is based off of a session that I've done recently, uh, a few times over my life, but actually I did this for the Texas Music Educators Association, TMEA, and I did this for the Midwest Clinic within the last couple of months. And if you've listened to the last couple of episodes about repurposing content, this is something that I'm trying. It's a talk that also then became an article that was published in The Instrumentalist, in January 2019, and now it's going to be a podcast, so we'll see how this goes. It The, the article title, I've had many titles for this, but the article title that was published is Building Better Bass Players, A Practical Guide to Getting the Most Out of Bass Sections. What I wanted to call this was Why Are Bad Things Happening Back There? And I was just talking with a teacher here in San Francisco about this very thing, which is... Uh, and I'm a former high school orchestra director. I've been many things in life, but I was that. And and this is sort of an offshoot of my work there up on the podium. And you play a chord. Like, let's say you got a G major chord and something is foul in the G major chord, which is a common thing in uh, educational setting. And so you say, okay, violins play your note. Okay, sounds okay. Violas play that. Okay, it's pretty good. Cello's okay. Yeah, yeah, do this. That's fine. Basses play your note. And this foul sonic thing comes out that is not even remotely close to anything you can understand. It's not even a pitch. It's kind of this like guttural barnyard noise. And why is that happening? That was the genesis for this clinic and for this article and now this podcast. So we're going to dig into that. The way I organized this was uh, diagnosing and solving common base problems. So I have a whole bunch of base problems and then some tips for keeping your base section happy and healthy and sounding good. So we're going to start off today with one of the most common problems, and I alluded to it, which is why are my bassists so out of tune? <laughs> and it's a challenging thing to diagnose. So why are my bass players, when I ask them to play X, Y, or Z, why is that not coming out? And since many of you, probably most of you listening, are bass players, you probably have a different perspective on this, but this is geared towards a non-bass playing audience. A violinist or a clarinetist up there conducting, turning, looking at the section, thinking, what the heck do I do? So here's what I told them. And by the way, I would love your thoughts on this. Uh, feedback at ContrabasedConversations.com. What did I leave out? What, what resonates? What should I include for a future session, which will almost certainly be happening? So here are my reasons. Number one, there are no tapes. Now, I realize that there are different schools of thought on this, but I do think that we're pretty much here in 2019 in favor of some sort of visual marking on our bases in the early stages at the very least. And if you look at Edgar Meyer and many, many, many other players that have dots marking their base or fingerboard inlays, I think that I think that having some kind of visual mark on the base is accepted. I accept it. <laughs> anyway, so not having tapes, there's one reason why your basses might be not out of, might not be in tune, might be out of tune, and and just not, you know, that, that, let's start there. Let's try to find some sort of visual mark. It could be tapes, it could be pencil marks, it could be dots on the side of the fingerboard, it could be anything like that, but give them something visually to go off, particularly in those early stages. So that's one reason. Another reason, I saw this today here in San Francisco. I see it every day I go and coach here. Uh, we're working slowly but surely to rectify this problem. But the second reason why your bases are out of tune is the action is too darn high. Many school bases are just impossible to play because they have overly high string action. 
So uh, chatting with Gary Upton of Upton Base, one of my sponsors, and we'll talk about sponsors in a second here, but uh, outside of the sponsorship deal, Gary and I have chatted about string height, and Gary, and apologies, Gary, if I'm getting this wrong, but I think I'm getting this right, Gary's recommendation is G-string should be six millimeters high, and then it goes up a millimeter for every string after that. So six millimeters for the G-string, seven millimeters for the D-string, eight millimeters for the A-string, and you guessed it, nine millimeters for the E-string. Take a ruler, check it out. Are your strings near that? If you're like many schools, I if if you're in a school setting, uh, check it out. And if you're like many schools, the answer will be no. You're radically higher than that. So um, now, sometimes. Uh, we don't, especially here in the Bay Area, I see very few bridge adjusters on bases. Um, part of that is because it's so consistent here that we don't need to raise the strings up or down, but you may not have any room to go down. So you may need to take your base, if if that's the case, you will need to get your base looked at or serviced, or you'll have to talk to the orchestra director to get that happening. Because you know, if the action's too high, it's not going to happen. Kids can't play it, or they're doing all sorts of crazy, bizarro things with their left hand, and it just doesn't work. And I know it's expensive, and I know it's a, but, but you know what? Uh, you're, the surest way to make someone not want to play bass is to have some sort of like bizarre strength contest, just trying to put the note E or F sharp on the D string down. So, and then if you can lower the strings, um, you, it's very common that you're going to need a fingerboard uh, j- uh, planing or just a dressing uh, because just lowering the strings might introduce all sorts of buzz, buzzes and that kind of thing, especially if the scoop is wrong in the fingerboard. These are things that really just need to be taken care of by a professional. Think of it like going to the dentist or getting your car worked on. You just need to do these things regularly. You are not equipped to be your own dentist and most of us i hope <laughs> uh, with rare exceptions and most of us are not equipped to really handle all the things uh, on our car maybe a few of us are certainly a few of us are and certainly a few of us are equipped to handle things on bases but generally we need to take these we need to take these in to a professional so why are my bases out of tune no tapes action too high the third one are fingers not fully depressing the string now that could be because of number two because of the action but it could also just be because the students aren't uh approaching the base with a nice c uh strong hand position with the thumb in the center of the back of the neck second finger and thumb opposite each other this is a big reason why basses are out of tune. I call it a squared left hand position. Everything's square about it. There's a good space between first and second finger. Two, three, and four are kept together as a unit. The fingers are coming down at a right angle perpendicular to the string, perpendicular to the fingerboard. And my good friend, Andy Anderson of the Lyric Opera of Chicago, my very first podcast guest ever on episode four <laughs> of Contrabass Conversations in 2007, 12 years ago. Andy has a great technique for this. He takes a Pops rosin container and puts it between the first and second fingers of the student, and he makes his great hand position. Hey, by the way, I have slides for this that I'm talking you through, and I will share. I'm going to make a note to do that right now. Pardon me. Okay, we now have links to both the keynote presentation and PDF of my handout for the clinic, so you'll be able to actually visually see all of this. But uh, Andy takes a pops container, puts it between the first and second fingers, and it works great. It, it actually gets that spacing happening. When I uh, encounter smaller hands, like sixth grade bass players or the like, I prefer to use something like a Carlson uh, container of rosin or something like that. But it really does work well for getting that hand position established. Okay, why are my bases out of tune? Number four. And I see this, I saw this today in San Francisco. I see it multiple times a week. I see it when I go and do clinics at various places. The base is too big for the student. The base is too big for the student. So I would rather see somebody on a slightly too small base than a too big base. What what do you do with a too big base? Too large of a base, you can't reach first position. I mean, that's not gonna work. So I always would err on the side of a student staying on a half size base for longer or a quarter size base for longer. Playing on a string length that's too long will just cause all sorts of bad habits in a student. If 
You have the student put their hand in first position and you have their first finger on the first tape and their fourth finger on the second tape. If they cannot reach this, they need a shorter string length. Now, the student might not know how to uh, understand how to open up the hand uh, correctly is a dangerous word, but I will just say correctly. Um, I remember I didn't really learn this or how to teach this until I had a class with Jim Chelland, great string pedagogue at Northwestern University. And he talked about how the fingers, you know, if you just open your hands like you're waving hello or something, you can only open your fingers so wide that way. But if you scissor your fingers fingers open, if you just right now wiggle your fingers in the air and you point the first finger up at the ceiling, you know, if you open up your hand like that, you actually have a much better hand span. And that's kind of the way the fingers are designed to move. They're not designed to really like open side to side. They're designed to move up and down. If you can get that hand position, this is much easier in in video form or presentation form than audio, I'm realizing as I'm describing this. But if you can get that opening of the first finger, um, that can help too. But the student might just be on too big of a base. So we're going to take a quick break and thank some of our sponsors. Then we're going to come back to the next common base problem. This episode is brought to you by the Bass Violin Shop, which opened in 2001 as a small double bass workshop in Greensboro, North Carolina. Today, they're staffed by three full-time, highly skilled bass luthiers, and they specialize in double bass sales, rentals, setup, restoration, and repair. For nearly 20 years, they have satisfied thousands of clients by offering quality instruments, knowledgeable service, reliable repairs, and superior restorations at affordable prices. They recognize that that traveling and flying with the bass can be a serious obstacle. That's why they now offer several options for the jet-setting bassist. Either rent their removable neck bass for a no-hassle, convenient way to take a bass in a small package, or convert your bass to a removable neck and never be without your companion for those important performances. Purchase their lemur music, Liberty Bell Flyaway. This package includes an airline-friendly custom travel case, and in minutes you can disassemble the bass and you're ready to go. Contact them to chat about options and find the one that best fits you. For more information and current inventory, visit their website at BassViolinShop.com and be sure to follow them on Facebook and Instagram. This episode is brought to you by D'Addario Strings. Our friends at D'Addario want to help listeners change their strings safely and efficiently, and they have a few tricks to help you achieve that. Here's a great tip. Change your strings two at a time, removing them from the inside out, then replacing them from the outside in allows for easy access to the lower pegs, ensuring strings lay neatly in the peg box. Learn more at orchestral.dedario.com. And thank you so much for sponsoring the podcast. Consistency among bass lines, consistency among the different products you offer, that's something that Upton Bass excels at. Here are Gary and Eric from Upton Bass on that topic. You know, like continuity of product, which we have fabulous reputation. We've got great product across the marketplace. Do you have seconds? No. Right, yeah, exactly, no. Seconds are in the dumpster. For almost 20 years, Upton Bass has been delivering top-notch bases at every price point, consistency and continuity, like Gary said, across the line. And if the wood's not good, like Eric said, it goes in the dumpster. They are the real deal, made in America. Learn more at UptonBase.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. Okay, so that was why your basis might be out of tune. Obviously, there are more reasons than that. But this next one, and this is kind of a related one, but why are there open strings out of tune? And this is something that as an orchestra director, I notice so many times and I've seen other orchestra directors encounter it, and it's like entering the twilight zone. Again, uh, we land on a chord and it is foul. Why is it foul? We must find out, so the, the orchestra director says. So check the violins, okay, figure it out, whatever. Eh, you can get that F sharp better, but okay. Get to the violas, okay, do this, do this, do the cellos, okay, basses, oh wow, that's not even remotely I should be hearing B I'm not hearing B I'm not even hearing A I'm not I don't even know what I'm hearing it's a nightmare okay uh play your open G string basses and then you realize wow their open G string is like a whole step or more flat and they're all a whole step or more flat how can it be that humans can play on strings that are out of tune blissfully happily seemingly uh, unaware of this so why? Why does that happen? Well, okay. So I think that 
I was just chat- again chatting with a cellist uh, earlier today about this. Her theory is that it is the bass pitch is so much lower than the human voice or the singing register that that it's just not a, a register that we're used to hearing. I think that, that she definitely has a point there. I also think that the the our our f holes being so low uh away from us that might be something too and just our open string pitch especially the a and e strings is just kind of hard to hear on basses and it, it, when i'm doing a clinic i generally at this point play my open a and e strings together like a violinist would tune their violins instead of the fifth we got the fourth i play that which is kind of sonic mud if you really think about it even when it's really in tune and i just challenge the people in that clinic can you hear if this is in tune or out of tune? And then I usually say, although I can kind of hear it, but I usually, I usually say I can not really tell. And so if I can't tell, how can a student tell? So the, the big reason why their open strings are out of tune is that they don't have a good system for tuning their open strings. All right, my private students, I teach how to tune with the harmonics in the traditional third position or the Vance Raboth second position. We all know what we're talking about. Again, easier on video or in person than in audio. But I teach those harmonics in an educational setting. I have found in a school orchestra, somewhere where people are not all taking private lessons. I found that it's, I found it, it's surprisingly hard for me to teach that. I might be just astoundingly bad at, at teaching kids how to do that. But I have realized that in a, in, a, in a school setting where you've got lots of different ability levels and people aren't taking private lessons, I really want them to tune each open string individually and I want them to do it with a tuner and I want them to get in the habit of doing that with a tuner and I want them to be able to do that themselves without involving me. So I highly recommend, and I would do this when I was an orchestra teacher, and I, I recommend it every time I do a clinic, get an electronic tuner that has some sort of clip on it. It can be one of those little ones that you just clip onto the bridge that sits on the bridge. There can be like one of the Korgs from the early 2000s that has a cord, and then you attach it to the bridge. However, get at least one of those tuners for the bass section and get them in the habit of just tuning every single time when they come in and passing it down the bass section. That is the most effective way to do it. You can use a, a phone app too. You know, I use Tonal Energy. I love that app. But uh, in a loud setting, and it's, it's not going to be as effective. So just get them in the habit of doing that. And, and you know, bass students have a remarkable ability to not really pay attention to the sound coming out of their instrument. That is my theory, but I, I think I've got some good uh, evidence of that. Uh, and so getting them to just clue into the sound that is actually coming out of their instrument and, and making sure that they're at least starting from correct open string pitch will go a long way to getting them in tune. Okay, next item. Again, this clinic was originally titled why are bad things happening back there why are their bows so crooked why when you look back are some of the bows not not at a 90 degree angle they might even be at a 45 degree angle or worse they might be almost like parallel to the strings why does this happen many reasons <laughs> bow hold for french bow players it's so easy for the frog to kind of slip down to the palm of the hand this lazy bow hand it's extremely challenging to correct once it's established and it's kind of comfortable if you try that so i get why that happens for students but you got to keep on top of that have the students how can you deal with this have the students keep their pinky on the dot on the frog that's a good one to do Focus on keeping the right hand squared and getting them in front of a mirror or taking a photo of them or flipping your iPad to selfie mode and having them just look and just wallow in what they're actually doing can be really helpful. At this point in the clinic, and check out the slides if you want to see it, I took, I took three of my sixth grade bass students and and they their bows were exactly 45 degrees uh, uh, in terms of uh, angle to the strings. They were like very, very not what we wanted. So I had them play. I took a photo. I showed it to them and they were like, oh, and they instantly fixed it. I find that to be extremely, extremely helpful. Also, reinforcing, and I do this all the time, especially in that er, that first year of playing, put the bow on the string and draw it with them. I'm holding the bow and I'm just moving the bow at a right angle 
and their arm, what, getting the arm moving the right way. If, if you get it at that right angle, the arm will move the right way and then let them take over. And they usually, hopefully, typically, um, tend to stay in that good path, that good lane. If you let them set the bow hand themselves, put it on the string themselves, uh, at least in, in my world, seven times out of 10, probably they're going to get crooked. So that's that's a good way to to establish that. Just keep on them for that bow hand and help them actually physically guide the bow in the correct path. Switching to German bow in the French bow world. I'm a French bow player, so apologies for not talking more about German bow. That can help break bad habits in French bow players. It's kind of a hard reset, I call it. And if someone's coming over a violin or viola or even shell, but especially violin and viola, sometimes switching to the German bow is a great way to avoid that pinky on top of the bow sort of thing that you see violinists and violists doing when they switch to bass. Now, German bow has its challenges in terms of a crooked bow as well, um, but I, I find that that has been helpful for sure in the past. Other reasons why they might be playing with a crooked bow. The end pin could be too low or too high, especially too low. Uh, Micah Howard of the Pittsburgh Symphony has a great app called I Double Bass. We've talked about it on the podcast. And Micah has students let their arm... He, actually, you should really check out in the app because it's clearer than my description, I'm sure. But he wants the right... When the bass is set at a good height, he wants the right hand... If you just let the right arm dangle, the right hand should contact the bridge between the fingertips and the big knuckles on the right hand. I find that that's, I've, I've been using that technique ever since I saw Micah describe that on I double bass. It's great. Um, having the end pin too high causes uh, center of gravity issues and I, it can cause all sorts of weird things in the bow arm too. So trying to get that just right, especially not too low, but, but, but trying to just find that Goldilocks just right height is super important. Another reason why they might have a crooked bow arm is not following through in the upper half of the bow and again, just helping them, give them a little training wheels in terms of getting the bow going and then letting them take over. So you're getting them in that lane, that positive lane that is, is great in terms of uh, developing that. Not falling through in the upper half of the bow is, is uh, what I mean by that is using the whole arm and then for the last half of the bow, opening up the right arm. Again, easier to see than for me to describe, but that if they, they can't help but do that if you guide their bow correctly. And if you don't, a lot of people try to use their entire arm and keep an angle at, at the elbow all the way through the stroke. Um, the, a me and, and even sh showing them that on a mirror, they don't really understand it, but if they feel it, if you can, sh if you can help guide their bow into that position physically and then let them take over, that seems to work really well. Also, number five reason why they might be having a crooked bow is just not engaging the back in the bow stroke. I, I find that if players think about engaging the larger muscle groups, the upper arm and the back, and thinking of the bass bow as kind of a pendulum, that tends to solve a lot of problems. And then number six, having the bass angled too wide. I have noticed this a lot the last couple of years here in San Francisco. I don't know if it's just some West Coast thing. Probably not. I'm sure it's not. But but a lot of people tend to have the bass kind of cello style in front of them. And that causes all, it just, do they default to that? It is kind of comfortable to hold it that way. So I understand why a, a player might default to that. But not having the bass at, uh, angled uh having not uh, how do i describe this jesus this is hard on a podcast um not having the bridge angled towards the bow enough yeah look at the slides it'll be easier uh, is is uh, a, a a big reason why i see crooked bows so just making sure that that base is at more of a 45 degree angle to the body rather than uh perpendicular uh parallel to the body if that makes sense. Uh, that was a horrible description, Jason. My apologies. But that's another reason. Base angle too wide. So bow so crooked. Bow hold could be an issue. End pin too low, end pin too high. Not following through in the upper half of the bow. Not engaging the back in the bow stroke. And having the base angled too wide. Okay, 
Left arms drooping. Why? Why do we see this? We look over there. The left arm is sitting. You know, I've seen the elbow sitting on the neck block. <laughs> That's common. Uh, focusing on a good squared left hand will help that arm drooping a lot. Also, like I was talking about with the right arm, getting a mirror on them, taking a photo of their left arm, putting my iPad in selfie mode and showing them that um, really will help with that. Okay, why are their left fingers collapsing? The fingers in their left hand. So many reasons, and a lot of them are related to instrument setup. The action could be too high. The nut could be too high, especially if we're down at the first position area. Uh, the fingerboard could be warping. We could have an overly stiff brand of strings. The bass could be too big for a student. The strings could be too old, or we could have bad posture or alignment issues. Misaligned left arm, not enough space between the neck and the palm of the left hand, the thumb not being centered in the center of the back of the neck, having a drooping left arm like I was just describing, fingers too flat or buckling and collapsing joints. So bad setup promotes bad technique as students attempt to use whatever means possible to get the fully depressed string that you need. So get that bass into the luthier, check out that action, get that low, and that will take you a long way towards developing good habits. I think a lot of the things we see are as a result of the student compensating to try to just get that string down. Okay, a couple more shout outs to our advertisers and we will be back with some more reasons why weird things are happening in the bass section. This episode is brought to you by the A440 Violin Shop. It's located just down the street from Wrigley Field in beautiful Chicago on the north side, just off the Brown Line. I have been going there my entire adult life, and they have been fantastic, both for repairs. I've had cracks repaired. I've had seams glued. I've had all sorts of students go to A440 to get instruments, to get bows. They're available with a smile, do wonderful work, and definitely check them out if you are in the Midwest. A440violinshop.com, and thanks for sponsoring the podcast. This episode is brought to you by Steve Swan String Bass. Steve has been active in the bass world and also the guitar world for years. Here's a bit from our live podcast taping with Steve on how he got into that business. Guitars... And basses. Guitars and basses. Okay, how did that happen? They're both helper instruments. I've always oh. played the rhythm guitar quite often with bass lines moving, either in swing style, jazz style, or country style. Bass is the same thing, supporting the band, the group of people you're playing with. So I've always felt like I was a support person. I love how Steve describes being a support person, and he is certainly that for the bass community here on the West Coast, here in the San Francisco Bay Area. His shop is located just south of San Francisco, and he has a large retail showroom with about 70 bases on display. And these bases are professional top-of-the-line bases. These bases are student-level bases and everything in between. They're beautifully set up. So if you're looking for a base or you know someone who is, be sure to check out Steve at steveswanstringbass.com. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast, Steve. Okay, we are back with more reasons why weird things are happening. Uh, and these are more musically oriented, but I think that they're still worth pondering and discussing. And I talk about them in this clinic and, and I see people nodding their heads and scratching their chins and thinking about it. So other, why are these things happening? Why are the bases dragging so much? There are, in my opinion, and I'm sure you have other opinions, uh, and feel free to chime in, feedback at ContraBaseConversations.com. Let me know any thoughts on this or things I should add or what you might do if you were presenting, because I do this multiple times a year, and I'd, I'd love your thoughts. Um, so, But in my opinion, there are three main reasons why bass sections drag. Number one, the bass is slower to speak, lower pitches, larger instruments, just takes longer for the sound to get going, and... Bass sections are notorious for playing late, and the request is frequently made for them to anticipate or play on the front edge of the beat. That certainly can work, but I found that if you say that to younger bass sections, it kind of messes with their head and makes them just doubt any concept of time. So again, I think that a lot of why things might be speaking late are slower, uh, are, are, are setup related. Setup, 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 so critical for... For everybody, oh, for bases. I mean, it's just, you just can't even do anything if you don't have a good setup. Fresh rosin, 
rehair once a year, hopefully in an educational setting at least, and and strings low enough, uh, strings that are not more than two years old. All of that will actually help with getting them speaking faster. Number two, distance from the ensemble. Basses, you gotta, I understand why basses are in the back. They will be blocking the view of everybody else if they're not in the back, but keeping them far in the back, it all, it causes both uh, difficulties with hearing and, you know, if we're talking with kids, they're just, they, it's easy to check out. They're in the back there. They're not really paying attention. Uh, they're, they're likely to be late because they're back there anyway. And they're also likely to be late because they're just checked out. So get them. They got to, I understand they got to be behind the other instruments, but get them as close to the ensemble as you can. And this will help them not drag. Also, I've noticed a funny tendency for bass players just kind of like slowly drift back over the days <laughs> in an orchestra. It seems like they get a foot further away from me all the time. They're perfectly happy to be back there just kind of doing their own thing, but get back there, pull the basses right up against the cellos or wherever they happen to be in the room, and that will help a lot. Also, why are they dragging fuzzy articulation? Some of that is set up, not having fresh rods or not having fresh hair, but also just understanding how to really put the weight into the bass and grab the string. I always use a bow and arrow analogy. I, I talk about making the bow grab the string like when you're going to play a pizzicato and just really having a clear front edge to the note, I think is critical for keeping the basses uh, with the ensemble uh, related. But another musical thing that people wonder about, why are bassists bow strokes not matching the rest of the group? I think that bassists can be slower to develop bow strokes. And I think a lot of that is due to teachers who are just a little bit leery about talking bass. There's really not much difference. Uh, and, and I understand German bow is a big difference. And that can be a confusing thing to a violinist or violist or cellist up there on the podium. But um, teaching teaching a, a spiccato to bass should happen when we teach spiccato to violin grabbing the string and having a clear articulation or being at the frog or using a full bow we should be talking to our basses just like we talk to our violinists violists and cellists um so getting crisp articulation on bass unlike violin viola cello in my opinion but i think it's true um, it takes so much more weight and sinking enough weight into the string from the arm and the back and then pulling the string with the weight of the bow and the back engaged in the bow then releasing that string again bow and arrow style i think that that is key to getting crisp articulation so catch and release is something I talk about a lot. Uh, for Martelet, using the bow and arrow visualization is great. And then getting the string going and then having the student ride the wave of the spinning string. I use these terms all the time. I talk about feeling like the arm is underwater in a swimming pool once you get this going and pantomiming these motions with the bass students and having them listen to the other string sections and just duplicate what they're hearing. That can go a long way toward getting them to develop the, a similar tone concept and articulation concept as the other string players. Now, why are basses not cutting off with the rest of the group? I think it is. Uh, well, I, again, I have three reasons. You probably have more, but one is distance. We've already talked about it, but they're back there. They're not really hearing the other sections well. They're not really listening to hear the sections. Um, also, hey, number two, bass strings just ring longer. If you play and in a clinic, I'll play an open string and I'll have people count the seconds until they hear it end. They just ring a long time. They gotta, we gotta do some left hand dampening of the strings to make, especially if it's an open string, right? To make sure that the notes cut off with the rest of the group. And then three, it's just not watching. Not watching the conductor, not watching the principal cellist, not watching the concert master. Watch and learn. Get the, all those different sections working, everybody connecting with the conductor, the principles of every string section connecting with each other, the people in that section connecting with their principal, and all that sort of stuff, and just reinforcing, reinforcing, reinforcing all the time. So that is the first big part of my Building Better Bass Players Clinic. This next part is called Simple Strategies for Better Sounding Bass Sections. And I will go through these briefly, but here's what I tell directors that are simple hacks. I guess they're hacks, kind of hacks, uh, to get your bass section sounding better. Number one, have fresh rosin available. One of the cheapest and easiest ways to make bass bass ugh, bass 
late night, not used to talking this much late at night. One of the easiest ways of making bass sections sound better is to increase uh, their, the frequency with which you replace rosin. It's cheap. Come on, just get get rosin a couple times a year. Yeah, I know they lose it. Yeah, I know. But but you're, you're going to have such better results if you have good rosin. And they're going to have more fun back there too. Number two, get the bases as close as possible to the ensemble. Get those stand racks out of there. Get those chair racks out of there. Get that extra garbage out of there and get the bass section right up against the rest of the ensemble. Number three, get bass stools. Do bass players stand? Sure, lots of bass players stand. Some sit, that's true, but all bass players would appreciate having the option to sit down, especially when the director is digging into some meaty, complex violin passage and and, and you're, you're, they'll thank you. <laughs> get stools. It's a good thing. Make sure the end pins are working properly. Make sure you can pull the end pins out. Make sure there are stoppers on the end pins. Make sure that you have end pins, uh, that you have end pin anchors, that you have straps. Make sure you have all of that stuff because unstable uh, end pin mechanisms letting loose, not being able to pull the end pin out enough, not being able to keep the end pin from moving all over the floor, those all really detract uh, in all ways from playing bass from having your bass section sound good and they're relatively easy fixes just make it happen number five give the bass space to bow make sure they're not bowing each other or they're not bowing stands or they're not locked in there because even if they can kind of bow if they don't feel comfortable to really take enough bow you're not going to get any sound out of them you're not going to get good articulation and they're going to be miserable so make sure that there's enough room they need more room than other players just give them enough room to bow Number six, have French and German bows. I'm always amazed when I see schools that have only French bows. I rarely see schools with only German bows, though I'm sure that does happen. About half of bass players play French, about half play German, and it's good to be able to play both. So make sure that you have enough of both. Number seven, change your bass strings. Professionals change them every year, so in a school setting, two years, three years max, right? Get fresh strings on there. George Vance is, is famous for saying that the worst thing about bass strings is they don't break <laughs> because they just kind of fade into a miserable state. Number eight, clear a path for your basses to get from the bass rack to where they are playing bass. I'm always amazed at the wounds I see on basses and how easily they could be avoided if you just didn't have garbage between you and the bass section. Again, stand racks, chair racks, random stands sitting around, uh, hi-hat from jazz band rehearsal, all that sort of stuff. Bass players, they're, you know, they're like waddling through the orchestra, kind of oblivious, wearing their backpack, talking with their friends. Boom, they run into that hi-hat. You got a big gash across the bass. Clear a path. It will save you a lot of Headache and heartache and money. Number nine, keep the bases humidified. We could have a three-hour podcast about this, um, but try your best to maintain a constant level of humidity, a consistent level of humidity. War, the, one of the worst things, again, I'm speaking as an amateur setup person. Luthiers would have better advice, I'm sure. But one of the worst things is having large fluctuations in humidity, going from super dry into like jungle room moist and 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 massive temperature fluctuations not good better to keep them consistent try to keep them in that mid-range 40 to 60 percent humidity ideally i remember that being very challenging in chicago it is extremely easy here in the bay area because that just is the bay area so it depends on where you are uh your uh, buildings are notorious. Schools are notorious for turning off the heat or turning off the air conditioning when school isn't happening to save money. Uh, try to make it clear to the powers that be that you're going to spend six grand in instrument repairs and have no instruments. That can be an extreme challenge to communicate that. But if you can find a way to communicate that, and especially in dollars and cents, that tends to work pretty well. And then number 10, schedule rest. Re oh, sorry. Late night, can't speak. Schedule regular luthier visits. Think of your luthier as your doctor. Think of them as your dentist. Think of it as your auto repair professional. Get those bases in or have them come to you or whatever setup you can work out. Have them look at the bases. Oh, it would be great to have it once a year. It'd be great to have it every three months. I know that probably won't happen. Once a year at a minimum of every base would be great. I guess two years at the way outset. But 
things just happen. Fingernoids, fingerboards need minor dressing. Bridges need adjustments. Seams and cracks start to open up. Be proactive about the health of your bases and you're bound to save time, money, and headache in the long run. Check out the handout that I have for this in the show notes for this episode. And I would love to hear your thoughts and elaborations and anything you might want to chime in. Again, feedback at ContrabasseConversations.com. Thank you for the team that helps me out with these episodes each and every week, except these few weeks, just because I'm trying to get ahead while I'm doing crazy travel. Uh, That team is Trevor Jones, Mitch Mooring, Krista Copper, Steve Cooper, and Steve... (laughs) late at night. Steve Hinchy, Michael Cooper, sorry guys. And they just help out so much. And I, I can't thank them enough. And I can't thank you enough for listening to my yammering, uh, long day uh, babbling. I remember now why I don't do podcasts late at night. But I just so appreciate having you along on this journey as we come up near 600 episodes. I never thought I would do this for 600 episodes. Well, maybe I thought I would, but I, I don't know. I, I certainly didn't think I would when I got overwhelmed and quit doing this back about 10 years ago. It's so great to be here each and every week chatting with you, and thank you for hanging out with me. I, I just so appreciate you taking the time for doing that, and we will see you again very soon for more life in the low end of the spectrum.